So water is your friend. And I understand there will be paving people that say, hey, milling guys, start off, run dry. I don't like running dry, and I'll tell you why. A, just take it but from the cleanup standpoint. It's easier to broom up damp material. I'm not saying flood it. Damp material than it is dry material. You also have to think about from a safety standpoint. You're just going to put a bunch of silica dust into the air for everyone to breathe. Nobody really wants to breathe this stuff in anymore, okay? So you think about what water is good for. It is a cool, it's a tooth lubricant, or excuse me, coolant. It's also a lubricant. So we put water in that tool, we want it to continually spin. We're trying to take away the heat, free it from debris, so it continually spin. Dust suppression. Dust suppression is human. I've talked about silica dust. We don't want much dust around the machine. We don't want to be breathing this stuff in. Plus also, it affects the visibility, especially if we're working at night. So we can't see what's going on around the machine. It also prevents buildups on components. So the less dust we're putting around this machine, because on, the on these leg barrels, they're greased. So if we have a lot of dust flying around, these fine particles are actually sticking to these legs. Think about now you just wrap, wrap the leg of this milling machine with sandpaper. Now you just put premature wear on it because all that grit and grime, constant movement of the machine, is starting to put premature wear on that leg barrel. So when it comes to holder wear, milling tooth goes into a holder. And some people say, well, I, yeah, I see that because what happens when the milling tooth stops spinning? You actually start seeing a white streak behind this machine. It's a dead giveaway because it's now the tooth is not rotating, it's just a flat spot. Okay, so it's hitting in the same location that tool every time. That's what gives you the streak. Okay, we let that wear long enough. Now we're starting to get into that holder. So a lot of people just think, well, I'll just put a new tool in and we'll be fine. Well, if you look here, my angle of attack is now off. This is a good holder, right in line. If I have a worn out holder and I put install a tooth, Notice, I'm not even hitting the carbide. I'm starting to hit hardened body steel. That tool is going to wear three times as fast. Our pattern is going to be affected. Definitely our quality is going to be affected. So you can see here they put a tooth in, the worn holder. You can see how it's starting to flat spot that tool. They let it go too long, and we get this beauty right here. Let's just say, for number's sake, milling tooth, five bucks. Holder, 50 bucks. Everything could have been handled if you just changed that $5 tool sooner. Because if you don't, then you get something like this. Nobody's going to be able to pay this for quality at all. Because now, what's happened, I drove my cost of operation up completely. I drove my quality down. So we cannot get our numbers cannot achieve our qualities from the milling or paving side with something like this. So what happens, so when we talk about tooth wear, milling, the holder wear, so if you look at our pattern up here, we're not consistent, okay? We're not gonna have the quality that the paving crew needs to pave something good on. You look at the bottom, we're, uni we're uniform. That's what we're looking for, we want the uniform. So you look at problems, I mean, bad holders and teeth. I mean, it's just the pattern, is, it's just really sketchy. And we've all been on roads that have patterns that look like this. And if you've tried to pave on something like this, you may just be like, well, that's just milled surface, no big deal. It's becoming more of a bigger deal on a daily basis in a lot of states. Okay? They're putting more specifications on the milling side so we can achieve higher quality on the paving side. So if you look at this pattern here, I'll just give you a few examples. Bad tooth, bad tooth, bad tooth, bad tooth. I mean, I could have gone all the way across this thing if we wanted to. But you can see these higher ridges. That's where the tool has stopped spinning. That's where we've got the wear. That's where we start getting that ridge. So with more and more states and jobs utilizing, say, intelligent compaction, I'm pretty sure we let that go bad enough, we'll be able to pick it up with intelligent compaction. We'll be able to see it. So milling at high speed, 
you know, that production, production thing. Pattern's gonna look bad. We're getting really rough. We're not maintaining the depth. We're over 120 feet a minute. Now, a lot of times what happens is you give somebody a machine with, say, 1,000 horsepower, oh, they wanna see it. You know, you, you know, you're gonna drive it like you stole it, right? I mean, you think you're Ricky Bobby. If you're not first, you last in this matter. So, but the thing is, we have to have the understanding. We need to back it off. There's no sense in running the machine to its ragged limits because understand, all we're doing is we got a snowball effect. Machine problem, quality problem, quantity problems. It all rolls in together. Is 120 year, do you decide to roll a thumb a break point between? Here, here's, my, here's my philosophy with feet per minute. If we're doing, say, full depth removal, we're just going to dirt or stone, okay? If it's just really easy material, like we see a lot of, like some parts of uh, the southeast where it's like very low aggregate, a lot of sand, you know, we just call it black sand basically. If we're not putting any kind of load on the machine, yeah, go, go, go as fast as you want, but understand, understand the limitations of the machine, how the material is going to act when you cut it up, because we may get underneath that material, get a massive chunk, it gets wedged on a conveyor belt, we've damaged some machines. Um, just find kind of the sweet spot area as far as where to run. But to me, if everything's perfectly smooth, 80 feet a minute, I'm great. I am great. If I've done my drum maintenance, 80 feet, your, your pattern is going to look great. We're going to be able to pave some good stuff off of it. So in a, an hour's time with your production that you showed earlier, you're looking roughly about 3,000 feet yes. per hour. Yes. Well, your truck Trucking. Trucking trucking stays there. You're, you're looking every now and then to make sure everything's cutting good. If you're averaging 3,000 feet so in a couple hours' time, you can have a couple miles, which is all you're oh, yeah. paving back. Yes. Versus being done in 30 minutes. Yes. So, man, that's another thing with communication. We'll kind of back up with communication. We're only as good as the trucks in front of this machine. So when I, we, before we can get started, I want to communicate with my crew like, hey, here's the job plan, here's what we're looking to do. If you can, get the drivers from the trucks. Get them with you and say, look, here is our plan of attack. Here's how we want to achieve this. And hopefully you can get them somewhat on the same page to where, just like with paving truck cycles, your milling truck cycle kind of gets in a rhythm. Okay? And that way we have less time sitting around Trucks understand where we need to be, and it's also a safety factor. They understand where you're going to be, what we're trying to do, so that way they know what to look for. Okay. Now we will go back to what we talked about a little earlier, as far as, well, if we add more teeth, what's it going to do? So on the far right, that's your standard 5-8 spacing drum. Okay. Basically every manufacturer, our standard spacing is 5-8 inch. That means you're 5-8 inch between tip of tooth to tip of tooth. Then we start stepping up to what we call a fine texture drum. Where you can take it down, say an eight millimeter, or even a micro, say six millimeter. I look at it this way. Say 170 teeth, say 400 teeth, say about 1,000 teeth, okay? Because you have a single hit fine texture drum, and you also have double hit micro drums. So I talked about, we saw that pitch, that video with a line spacing, one tooth per revolution makes contact with a double hit drum. Now you have two teeth in that same line spacing, 180 degrees apart. So two teeth in the same line spacing. So the difference is, you can look here, are peaks and valleys. So basically your tooth's hitting right here. So we think we call it peaks and valleys, okay, or pattern. You can see with a fine texture drum, that pattern starts to tighten up. Our line spacing is tighter. That's a standard space drum. It looks fine. It's a good pattern. But you look at it as far as like with fine texture drums. You know, I talk about coarse, the coarseness nature of the pattern. You look at a fine texture drum, and you look at the peaks and valleys, the size of those. Okay, we're starting to, it's going to be a much tighter pattern. And the slower we go, 
the smaller those peaks and valleys will get. So then you'll have a texture that looks like this. It's very smooth. A lot of times when we use a fine texture drum, we're going to leave it open for traffic for a little while. Sometimes you may see this on a curvy mountain road where they've had a lot of runoffs. They may just come in and fine mill the corners just to get a little extra traction on the corners. They'll do that. Here's the trade-off between a standard drum and a fine texture drum. A standard drum, 5-8 spacing, is made to mill the maximum depth the machine's capable of milling. A fine texture drum, we shut it down at an inch and a half. Because what happens is, we talk about augering material. When I have that 5-8 space drum, I have all that area in between those wraps of teeth for material to flow. When I double the amount of teeth, I lessen the area that material has to flow. Makes sense so far. Another downside is somebody's got to change these teeth on a micro drum. I always recommend give it to the new guy. Okay, because nobody wants to do it. So we talk about overall condition machine. You know, these are factors that control good patterns. So if my machine's beat up, hydraulics aren't reacting properly, am I going to be able to achieve quality? No. Got to make sure we maintain these machines. Something that's somewhat overlooked is our track pad condition. So if you have a track pad on one of these machines that goes bad, don't replace just the one track pad. Replace all of them. Because what happens, if all these other track pads are worn, say, to here, and you put a brand new one on there, every time that track pad makes contact with the ground, leg's going to move. What are we doing? We're affecting the machine. We're affecting our quality. Our cutter drum condition, you know, drum maintenance on these machines is crucial. I could put nine jet engines on a milling machine which would be kind of cool. But if my drum is shot and I haven't done the drum maintenance, it doesn't matter. We're not going to really go anywhere. I'm just kind of slinging horsepower at nothing. We'll cut our tooth holder condition. A rotation speed, I just talked about a little bit. You can change the, the drum speeds on these machines, uh, whether it be through changing shift sizes on the drive or the new machines. There is a selector switch on how to do this. You just need to understand whatever manufacturer machine is out there, what are its capabilities as far as its milling drum speed. So we can, you know, that way we can achieve the highest quality we can get. Our grade control system, always try to check the grade control system before you start. Okay, make sure you've got all the components you need. Make sure if we're going to run, say, an averaging ski, make sure we've got all those components because we don't want to show up and then, oh, we're missing a bracket. Now we can't utilize it. We're missing a cable. We can't run it. We need to make sure all these things are working in proper order. Our pavement conditions, like I said, it never hurts to drive the road. Because if you see a manhole cover, you might want to mark it out. Any kind of obstructions you can see, you're not going to see them all. Hit as many as you can. That way, we're kind of going back to the communication, relaying of information. That way, the crew can get the best quality. <clears throat> Ground speed, we need to slow it down so we don't drive it like we stole it. We back it off a little bit. That way we're going to achieve our quantities and our quality. Water, don't like running dry because I don't like changing teeth. Simple as that, I don't like changing teeth. I don't like sucking in dust and I don't like changing teeth. Okay? No, I don't think anybody does at mills for a living. I need a good crew. No matter what manufacturer machine you have, no matter what horsepower of this machine, if I do not have a good crew, it all is right out the window. I need a crew that can actually communicate, understands what we're trying to achieve, and go out and get it done. A good crew is priceless, and it's hard to come by because for whatever reason. <laughs> Daily maintenance. I always tell people, you give me 30 minutes at the end of the day, I'll save you a lifetime of headaches. Clean the machine. Okay? If you, if you have an excess amount of buildup, the machine's going to start to prematurely wear down. It's going to have more breakage. Okay? 
lubricate the machine according to the manufacturer manufacturer specifications. If it calls for five shots of grease a day, give it five shots. What kills me is when you say, well, I'm going to grease it. And you just pump a whole tube of grease in. Now we have all this grease flying everywhere. Okay? Couple of things. All that excess amount of grease collects dust. I talked about wrapping the leg in sandpaper. Think about that. Let's say we've put grease on the ladder because we're like, oh, it's all over the place. Let me just swipe here on the ladder. Operator's trying to climb up the ladder, puts his foot in some grease, comes off the ladder. It's not going to end well. It's going to hurt. I'm old. I don't recover like I used to. Tool changing. Go ahead and change the teeth at the end of the day. That way all we got to do is show up the next morning and go to work. I mean, it, it starts off the day on the right foot. We get a better sense of feel because instead of like, I was going to get out here at 6.30, start milling at 7, but now i got to get out here at 5 so I can change teeth. Our attitude's changed. Okay? The whole outlook of the day has changed. Check for leaks and repair accordingly. If you see a hydraulic leak, put a wrench on it or have a mechanic who's there put a wrench on it. Okay? And it's just the simple things because if we let it leak long enough, now our hydraulic level's down. Does the machine want to react the way it used to? No, because it doesn't have the hydraulic capability anymore. So in conclusion, I ask myself those questions again. Did I obtain the information I need to achieve quality? Quality, excuse me. Yes. Did I give my crew that information? Did I achieve quality and get my quantities? Was my preparation of my machine to the point I didn't put excessive wear on it. I'm not saying you're not going to put some wear on it, but not abuse it. But last but not least, did my crew achieve our goal and work safe? Okay, And I'm sure you guys have seen some safety videos already today. You understand we only can control what's in our little bubble. We don't control everybody driving around out around us with these things, not paying attention to what we're doing. Okay? So, my philosophy for the five of us out there to the five of us going home. Always be aware of your surroundings. Always make sure you like, keep an eye out for something that's coming up. Because then we go back to that communication. Like, hey, we're coming up to kind of a sketchy spot in the road. Stop the machine. Let's discuss it. How are we going to figure this out and get around it? And always work safe. That's it.